This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 266, recorded on May 26th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. You got 90 degrees there yet? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, a, it's a come. It's a come, and we're going to have it until probably November. Yeah, we went back to... Uh, cold weather after a 90 degree weekend it's now in the 50s really weird also joining us from uh st louis petra levin welcome back it's great to be here uh st louis right now is 70 and um light rain we've had rain on and off last weekend was kind of wild weather that we get in missouri in the spring um <laughs> <laughs> and uh i think now we're just down to light rain hopefully and hopefully that's it for the next few days all right, so now we have a snippet and a paper for you, both uh, kind of out there, as you'll see. <laughs> so let me take you through our snippet, which is a cell paper called Spindle-Shaped Archaeal Viruses Evolved from Rod-Shaped Ancestors to Package a Larger Genome. I actually have a rod-shaped virus here, and and it doesn't do the listeners any good, but Michael and Petra can see it. This is a rod-shaped virus made up of individual subunits. These happen to be magnets that you can uh, put together into a rod-shaped particle. And this is going to be important as we go through this. This comes from University of Virginia, University of Paris, the Institut Pasteur, Yale University, and uh, the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research. And this happens to be a virus that cannot make you sick. Uh, yes, they cannot make you sick. <laughs> Just uh, or but, kill sick. But if you try and study it, you might get sick because of they the live in pretty extreme conditions. The first authors, uh, Fen Bing Wang and Virginia Svirkate Krupovich, and the corresponding authors are Mart Krupovich and Edward Eagleman. And I know Mart Krupovich. I've met him. He's into these um, archaeal viruses. So, uh, Virus what what distinguishes a virus is the capsid, the protective shell around the genome, as opposed to other mobile elements that move around. And capsids have been um, have evolved in, in many independent ways. Many of them have come from cellular genes, um, and um, there are really two kinds of capsids. The, the rod-shaped one that I just showed you, which is actually built with what we call helical symmetry because the protein nucleic acid complex uh, goes around in a helix. And then there are icosahedral uh, viruses such as poliovirus, um, which, which are shells, which are uh, spherical shells basically, uh, and they're composed uh, of repeating subunits as well. In fact, one of the contributions of Watson and Crick, besides uh, figuring out the structure of DNA, was they figured out that viruses are either rods or or spheres. And, of course, they didn't know about archaeal viruses because they're, <laughs> they're an exception. The viruses that infect archaea, which we occasionally talk about archaea here on TWIM, um, but never any other podcast. So this is where this paper has to go on TWIM. Uh, they have viruses that infect them, and they have odd-shaped morphologies that aren't observed with any other viruses. And these morphologies <laughs> include, they look like droplets, champagne bottles, or spindles or lemons. They're very different. And uh, these archaea, of course, uh, inha can inhabit uh, extreme environments, not always, but they can. And so the viruses need to be able to uh, survive or retain infectivity at in boiling water, low pH, pH 2, high salt. It's just remarkable. Imagine boiling sulfuric acid at 2,500 atmospheres. <laughs> That's just, effectively what these suckers are surviving. That's extreme. Yeah. Right? 
All right, so these spindle-shaped viruses, that's what we'll call them, they fall into two groups, roughly. They're smaller spindle-shaped viruses, you know, different families. We don't need to tell you what they are. Uh, and then they're larger spindle shape. Think of a lemon, right? Roughly a lemon. Uh, the, the smaller ones look like the lemon, and the bigger ones look like lemons with tails coming out of both ends. So they're both lemons, but one of them has these tail extensions. And um, the, the tails are interesting because they actually develop after the virus particles leave the cell, which is one of the few examples of particle morphogenesis happening outside of the cell. And so, um, and that we have no idea how that happens. But um, in this paper, they're going to solve the structures of uh, a simple and a, a small and a large um, spindle-shaped virus. Now, getting back to my magnetic model of uh, a rod-shaped virus, the rod-shaped viruses and icosahedral viruses are all, they're all using what we call genetic economy because you know, genomes, at least we used to think, are, are typically very small. Now we know they can be really big too. Um, and so you can't devote a lot of coding region to capsid. So what, what is done is to take one or a few protein subunits and repeat them over and over. In the case of a helical structure, you have a single protein subunit. It's simply repeated many, many times to form uh, the particle. Same thing with icosahedral particles. Um, and a key to understanding icosahedral particle structure was the finding by Casper and Klug uh, in, in the 60s that, you know, a, a simple icosahedron. Do I have one here? It's behind you in yeah, the, I do. the pillow. It's made of, uh, yeah, the pillow is, but I have one made of magnets too. So this is the smallest possible icosahedral shell. It's composed of 60 subunits. So there's 60 uh, magnets here. and in that kind of structure, they all occupy equivalent environments. They all interact in similar ways. But if you want to make bigger viruses, what you do is you add more subunits. You don't use bigger proteins. You add more subunits, and the viruses can get much bigger. But then as soon as you add more than 60, you no longer have equivalent interactions. You have what's called quasi-equivalence, and that's what Casper and Klug determined. The helical structures, on the other hand, they're all equivalent. But we're going to see in this paper a, a new way of looking at that. We're going to actually see some helical structures that are not uh, equivalent. They're quasi-equivalent. Okay. So they solve structures of two spindle-shaped viruses of archaea. What they had to go through was heroic. And I can't bring you through it because it will take too long. But it turns out that other people thought they had crystallized the or solved the structure of the capsid proteins of some of these viruses. They were the wrong proteins. <laughs> They're not structural. Can you imagine? They're out there. They're published. But these guys say, no, actually, these are not. These are contaminants. They're not the structural protein. So they have to go through quite a lot of biochemistry to finally get uh, the virus particles uh, purified uh, and solve their structures. Um, and they do. And so they do a structure for a, a, uh, a small one and a large one. And what they both have in common is their helical structures, very much like helical viruses that we know about, but they have differences. And one of them is they're composed of seven independent uh, helical strands of protein. So just imagine seven strands lined up against one another and they curl around to make a cylinder and they keep going. So it's not just one that goes around. So in this ma magnet model that I have here, there's just I just have one strand. but in these viruses, there are seven parallel that – it's just amazing, right? They're called left-handed seven starts. You can have three starts and two starts. They've been seen in other structures. So they both have this left-handed seven start structure. And um, so that's cool. And they find that the two kinds of viruses, the, the ones with and without the tail, they have the same seven start structures. and. What they eventually determine is that the simple particle is actually uh, a, a precursor to the larger particle with the tails. They're exactly the same structures. It's just that uh, the genome is inside and, and one is bigger uh, than the other. And so what has to happen 
this simple virus, the small one with the lemon-shaped spindle body. If you take the genome out of it, it becomes a rod. Those seven start helices become a rod. So just putting the genome in makes it that spindle shape. And so how does it expand? Well, it turns out that those seven start helices, all the uh, hydrophobic amino acids are on the inside. And it makes a very tight shell, which they say is probably needed to keep the low, the acidic conditions away from the nucleic acid, right? So it's a good protector. And they also point out that the inside of the viral capsid is probably the same pH as the archaeal cytoplasm. Yes, it's a neutral pH, not acidic, right? Yeah. So it's packaged in the archaeal cytoplasm at that pH, and then it remains that. But the, the hydrophobic residues are on the inside, so the structure can slide and accommodate insertion of the nucleic acid. And they know this because if you take the particle and and force the nucleic acid out, which they can do, it then becomes a rod. It no longer looks like a lemon. It becomes a rod. And then the bigger viruses with the tails are simply longer. They have the genome inside, and the tails are extensions of the... It's all the same symmetry. And in fact, it's no longer equivalent because of the structure. It's not like a rod-shaped virus any longer. There's quasi-equivalence here, which is the first time this has ever been observed for a helical structure. So they're expanding quasi-equivalence theory to helical viruses, which has never uh, been seen before. So that's, they think that the minimum energy conformation of these capsids is a tube, right? And again, the evidence for that is when you release the genome, the spindles become tubes. So the genome makes them spindles, and then you just use a longer structure to make the, the bigger viruses with the tails at each end. So they say the unusual spindle results from a radial expansion of a rod. So just think of a a rod-shaped helical structure. You expand it, and all the helices have to slide past one another, right, to get bigger and bigger. And they can do that because they're hydrophobic. At least they think so. Um, so that's that's the story, which is – I think this is a paper for the textbook, actually, because this is establishing a new – kind of structural uh, motif for uh, these these rod-shaped viruses and specifically that they can be quasi-equivalent uh, as well. Um, as I was thinking about it, is it sort of like an, um, an open and closed umbrella? In one form, it's clo a closed umbrella. And then when the nucleic acid's in there, it's an open umbrella. I wouldn't use umbrella. It's well, remember it, those seven strands yeah. are sliding past one another as the yeah. thing expands. I don't know what to call it, but I they, they have is, movies right. in embedded into this paper. And yeah. I dumped into the show notes uh, the image showing the seven star proteins, each in a different color that will help you visualize it. Um, and the movies uh, enable you to see how this how would Vincent's trying to describe actually happens? So the other uh, conclusion from this is that these larger spindle viruses with the extensions at the end essentially evolved from the simple rod-like viruses. So you had a rod-like virus, which even with the genome in it is a rod. And then those became lemon-shaped viruses, say, with a, with a bulge in the middle. And then they have extensions on their ends as well. It could all come from the same rod-shaped structure. Anyway, I thought this was very uh, cool. And next year when I teach virology, I will certainly incorporate this into it because it's a really interesting principle. It is really beautiful. Do they have, and this is what I was looking for, but how do these viruses infect the archaea? I like realized I don't no, I mean, you always see these pictures of like Lambda or the bacterial yeah. viruses doing infections. Yeah, I I'm mean, trying many to imagine of, uh, how they sit down on the surface. Right. But in the bacterial viruses, they typically poke holes in the exactly. membranes, right? I'm not sure what happens here because the membrane is very different, right, from, right. from bacterial membranes. And I don't know if there are, because there's no endocytosis, right? <laughs> No, or I mean, I assume there's no endocytosis. So, I yeah. mean, I'm guessing it's an injection, like in, in E. coli. Yeah. And other I, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of any of that. That's a good question. But yeah. I, I haven't thought that much about 
viral Arpea. shape. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of the bacterial viruses we study, the DNA viruses, the phage have, you know, they look kind of related to each other, but these look so different from. Yeah. I wonder if it's like M13, where it looks for a pillus and then injects its nucleic in through the pillus. Could be uh, if they have pili, right? I don't know if yeah. they do. Hmm. I don't know. Good question. Well, I mean, I'm sure the answer I, is. I think out there. Uh, we have some topics to pull on our basic archaea. Yeah. And viruses of archaea. We we have future there there's a whole body of literature out that we yep. have skimmed over. So we gotta look for some of those papers. We have been very bacteria centric. For yeah. sure. For sure. Elio has done one twim about the lipid differences between archaea yeah. and bacteria, remember? The yes. ether linked lipids versus yeah. the ester linked lipids. Yeah. But the anyway. physiology of these guys is really interesting. So it is. It is. All right. That's all for me, Petra. Okay. <laughs> so we have a paper here from the title is Non Invasive Assessment of Gut Function Using Transcriptional Recording Sentinel Cells. It's from Florian Schmidt, Jakob Zimmerman, Tan May Tana, Rick Faruni, Tyrell Conway, Andrew McPherson, and Randall Platt. And it's really a collaboration of groups uh, between ETH Zurich, Bayern University, Oklahoma State, and the University of Basel. I want to point out that the first two authors contributed equally. And so this paper is really amazing. Like the whole premise of it is is incredible. So essentially what they're trying to do is understand what happens to bacteria as they pass through the gut. So the microbiome inside our gut in a way is a black box. It's often mostly studied by looking at fecal samples so that you get the end product. It's obviously very invasive to sample higher up in the gut. Um, and so in a way, it's a black box. We know it comes out one end, but we don't really know what happens to bacteria as they pass through the gut. Or really, we can do RNA-seq, and that data has been very difficult to parse how bacteria respond to different diets. You'll see differences, but you have so many different organisms in the gut it's, and so many complicated things going on, it's really hard to understand. And again, there's this whole idea of you have to sort of disrupt the system to understand the system. So in a way, the microbiome is kind of like a black box in which lives Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> That's um, right. And this has been a big problem in the field. So again, you can't see what happens without disturbing it, and then you've disturbed it. So really, what is it going on? So this technique, um, which they call RecordSeq, takes advantage of sentinel cells, so cells that they can easily manipulate, but also that travel through the gut to get closer to a non-invasive study of microbiome behavior or the behavior of organisms in the microbiome. And I would not go as far as to say this is completely non-invasive for reasons that I'll go into, but it's much, much closer to non-invasive than we've had in the past. And so really the most amazing thing I think about this paper is they use a technology, which um, hopefully we'll put it in the show notes. This uh, lab had published earlier, one of these labs had published earlier, which is to record changes in gene expression as they remove through the colon. And it uses CRISPR technology. So I know TWIM has delved into CRISPR, so I'm just going to be pretty brief on this one. But basically, classically, CRISPR is a way for bacteria that survive an infection with a bacterial virus to remember these viruses. So the next time they see them, they can prevent them from really infecting and killing them. And the way that CRISPR works is the survivors are able to kind of take a little bit of the genome of the virus and put it into sort of a collection in the bacterial genome. So bacteria have these, many species of bacteria have these long stretches of these little tiny sequences that are called spacers that um, are made into small RNAs and they bind to a nuclease called Cas and that spacer is sort of around and when the virus the same virus infects again that little mRNA can hybridize with the DNA of the virus 
but it brings along this nuclease, which cuts the virus genome and kills it so that it can't be used. So again, it's basically just a way for the bacteria to sort of remember the history of its ancestors who were lost to this particular virus or other viruses. Okay, so that's the classical reason version of CRISPR. That's what most, you know, sort of bacteria use it for. Obviously, there's a whole nother set of CRISPR that's for genome engineering, but that's wasn't what it was originally developed for in the bacteria through evolution. Okay, so this system really relies on this idea that you can use these spacers to record information. In this case, they use a different method. They use a reverse transcriptase kind version of CRISPR so that they can record gene expression by the bacteria. So imagine a bacteria going through your gut first, you know, it enters your stomach and it's super acidic and bad things happen. But the ones that make it through your stomach into your ileum, sort of your small intestine, and then into the different parts of your colon, they're going to experience different environments. And as we've talked about many, many times on this program, as they experience different environments, they turn on certain genes, for example, they use different sugars or respond to changes in pH, and then they might move further in the gut and they might turn off those genes and turn on different ones because the environment's changed. So as they move through the gut, they're going to turn on genes and off genes as they move through the gut. So using this CRISPR technology, essentially it's constantly recording what's happening in terms of taking mRNAs, messenger RNAs that are expressed, copying them using reverse transcriptase into things that can be stored in these spacer arrays, these little arrays of memory. And then when they come out the other end, I, the idea is that they can just be sequenced, these spacers, and match to genes that we know that are annotated in the bacterial genome and figure out what they do. So for example, if this is going through your gut, it sees uh, a drop in pH, you would expect the bacteria to have to turn on genes to respond to that low pH. And so that should be recorded in this spacer in these bacteria that you get out the other end, maybe in the mouse poop, for example. Okay. And so if you think about it, this is really a riff on the science fiction movie, The Fantastic Voyage, that was published in 19 or came out in 1966, where you literally have this miniaturized submarine going through the human body and you're literally witnessing all the perturbations. And if you recall that movie, you see that the immune system's attacking it and all of these other things. So as it's recording and the data that Petra's going to introduce us to is really pretty straightforward. It's all about diet of what the mice are going to be eating. But if you think about it, think about how an immune system is going to be responding to the bacterium. And if we can record that event of the bacterials, bacterium's first look at the immune system interacting with it. And it, it, when I read this paper, I was trying to wrap my head around it and think about how to convey it to the listening audience in a simple way. And it's really the fantastic voyage that, <laughs> you know, every, you know, it's, it's a wild movie. It, it's it, a wild movie. I know. I think, I think for me, it would be uh, inner space with Dennis Quaid, a similar that, idea. That could be too. And then I think for the millennials and maybe even my children, there was a great magic school bus episode where the magic school bus does something similar, shrinks down and goes through yes. the body. So you, I, these, these movies are really amazing, but I think that's really exactly what's going on, ex except for the recording method is... Um, pretty wild. It's using these little pieces of essentially taking the gene expression and putting it in there. It's really, really cool. Okay. So I think we all have our own analogies here, which is great. And, and um, I'm waiting for the next movie like this because I love them, actually. In this paper, they, they basically engineered the system. They put it into MG1655 E. coli, which is a human isolate old, old, and it's a lab, but really, basically, it's a lab strain. It's what my lab uses. Most labs that use E. coli use uh, a lot of them use MG1655 or other K variant, K strain, K12 variants. Um, it 
is the sentinel that they're using. And they use it, I'm guessing, because it's very easy to manipulate. It's not necessarily a bacteria. It's Well, it's not a mouse gut bacteria for sure. And it's not even really a wild E. coli because it's been in the lab so long. It has um, a few mutations of its own. It has de- uh, it has difficulty growing without pyrimidines, um, and it also has um, some other mutations in it. But it's it grows pretty well, and I think for this purpose, it worked quite well for them. Um, and they have this MD sixteen fifty five. They put this crisp a plasmid with this CRISPR system in there. They can induce it using uh, anhydrotetracycline, so they can turn on record seek when they want, which is something they don't really play with. But in theory, you could turn it on and off if you wanted to do that. And um, they basically force feed it into the mice. They it's called gavaging. They basically force these bacteria into the stomachs of the mice and then they just let them go through the digestive tract. Um, again, this is a huge step forward because previous sentinel studies, you could look at one gene maybe turning on with a fluorescent infusion and a really powerful uh, recording giant like recording device, but it's very difficult you couldn't do more than one gene at a time. And because this is sort of unbiased, it's essentially every mRNA that's expressed, whether it's important for going through the gut or not, is going to be recorded. Can you explain, I don't understand why these uh, mRNAs are going to be incorporated into the into the CRISPR array. So the uh, CRISPR setup here, instead of having a sort of standard setup, it yeah. has a reverse transcriptase that mm-hmm. reverse transcribes the mRNAs, and then that is put into this space or essentially made, takes the mRNA, makes it into DNA, and that is uh, put into the spacer region. So is in a normal CRISPR-Cas, any foreign DNA that comes in is, is put into the array. So why does... Why is the, the, uh, the transcript... Why are the transcripts seen as in that way? I don't get that part. Because it's engineered to essentially, instead of recognizing DNA, foreign DNA, really. it just recognizes transcript, mRNA transcript. So and it doesn't by making DNA, them. That's there's the no part. nuclease. It's just. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that you're making DNA, which shouldn't be there, that triggers the incorporation. No, it's RNA. It's RNA. You're making the RNA because the engineered system has a reverse transcriptase. So it's looking at the sheer volume of the transcripts that are being produced at the given time. And my suspicion Mm. is it's based on the volume of transcribes that are coming off. So Mm -hmm. um, I have to read the original paper to see how they control for rare transcripts versus abundant transcripts to know whether or not you're going to be able to pick up a rare transcription okay. event. Right. You're, you're, they're clearly able to sense, you know, things that are not housekeeping and able to yeah. sort it out. But they're looking for differences, things that change. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's a huge step forward. So the first experiment is really proof of principle. Um, they determine if the record seek collects sequentially as E. coli move through the gut. So again, your gut is super long. I always forget exactly how long, but it's always, you know, that's one of the things you learn in like elementary school science. Um, and this, they sample by time and position. So they're basically sacrificing mice and seeing, uh, what's in the, what's, what has been recorded as they move through the gut. So the first important thing is, they see more spacers collected over time. So essentially, the longer the system is allowed to collect mRNAs or record them, the more different kinds of spacers that they get. And they see most of the collection is in the cecum, colon, and, colon, and feces, not in the small intestine or ileum. And this makes sense because E. coli probably is not very happy there and probably isn't doing that much there. In the second experiment, which is really the experimental. So the first is really proof of principle. They collect more over time. They see more as they get lower down in the intestines, in the gut. Um, The second experiment, I think, is where they really start to actually uh, test things. So they feed bacteria different diets. They give them standard mouse chow, a starch, or a high-fat diet. And so in the microbiome field, and when we think about our microbiomes, one of the thing is the microbiomes are obviously influenced by what we eat. And there's actually a good amount of data that says the composition 
of your microbiome can be influenced by what you eat. And, you know, that's just looking at all the organisms in there, right? There are many, 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 many organisms in your gut and the composition and who's what's more there, what is sort of dominant and its species versus not changes with diet. So they're basically doing this same kind of experiment, but they're only looking at this E. coli that they've engineered to serve as a sentinel and looking at how it experiences different diets. How does it change its gene expression in response to the different diets? So what's really cool here is they compare their record seek data which again is just you know permanently putting it into these little CRISPR arrays to RNA seq. So RNA seq is just when you take all, essentially you'll collect all the E. coli in the gut and you will make mRNA. So whatever when you collect them, essentially it's a snapshot of when you sample. You make uh, take the RNA, you make it into DNA, and you sequence it. So that's RNA-seq. That will tell you whatever genes were expressed when you sample them, not over time, like in record-seq. So they're comparing the signatures from different diets in the RNA-seq snapshot versus record-seq. And so the first thing that they look at really is if you change the diet, the signatures from different diets are really lost in RNA-seq, which makes sense because you're only looking at what those organisms are doing at that moment in time. But in record-seq, you can see how their gene expression was previously versus how their gene expression changed with diet by doing a comparative analysis. Okay, so that's, I think, a sort of more proof of principle. But then they do this really, what's really neat and, and not entirely unexpected, but really gratifying to see is they see differentially expressed genes. So when you feed organisms, when you feed the mice different things, right, the mice and the organism are going to try and digest that and the bacteria are going to also be digesting it in their gut. So if you feed them starch, the bacteria will see the starch. If you feed them high fat, they're going to, the bacteria are going to see high fat. And one important thing about this is these are notobiotic mice. The only organisms in their guts in these experiments are these E. coli. So they are feeding essentially the mice these three things, regular chow, starch, and high fat. And they see, they drill down really on one set. So in the starch-fed mice, so the high carbohydrate, low protein, low fat, they see, first of all, anaerobic but anaerobic respiration. And the reason they know it's there is because they see ex gene expression that allows... E. coli to use nitrate as an electron acceptor, um, which uh, instead of oxygen. Um, but I think more interesting to me, because we study pH perhaps, is that they see adaptation to low pH, changes in potassium uptake, and specific types of carbon utilization. So essentially, when the mice are fed starch, the environment of their gut changes, the pH drops. Um, probably in part also due to the activity of the bacteria. Um, and the bacteria have to change their gene expression in order to adapt to that new environment. So in chow-fed mice, though, they see genes uh, expression for uh, using different kinds of carbon, diverse types of carbon sources. So again, chow has kind of got a mix of plant-based things and other things. And so the bacteria, when they're in the chow-fed mice, they have a whole bunch of different carbon sources to choose from. And so you see gene expressions for using all those. In starch, uh, the carbon sources they have uh, available to them are much more restricted. Um, it's really mostly sugar acids, which are probably coming from the host mucus. Based on the transcription, it appears to be uh, genes for gluconate and galactourinate catabolism are upregulated in bacteria in the starch-fed mice. And they want to know, okay, so they see this, right? They see that in the starch-fed mice, the bacteria are upregulating genes to use these sugar acids. They want to know if it's important, so they do a mutant analysis. Um, they use a mutant that can't catabolize gluconate, so one of these major sugar acids, because it lacks two isoforms of gluconate kinase. And so that means that when they put this bacteria in, uh, the starch-fed mice, it shouldn't do that well because it can't use one of the major carbon sources available to it. 
And they actually do a competition assay and with wild type MD1655 and these double mutants that don't have the gluconate kinase, and they're outcompeted 10 to 1 when they essentially do a little competition. We put in equal amounts at the beginning, we gavage them with equal amounts of these wild type and mutants, and at the end, the ones that can't use gluconate are outcompeted 10 to 1 in the starch bed mice. Okay, so I love that. It's like a little kind of collect, uh, you know, it's a complete little mini set of experiments. We see this change in gene expression, and we can then test if it's important using these mutants. So that I think is really great. Um, the third experiment, they look along the digestive tract. Um, so again, in the beginning, they saw, they just tested over time, you know, is this recording system working? Do we pick up more things? How is it different from the RNA-seq? Here, they actually look at differences along the uh, digestive tract in the different backgrounds. And what they find is that in the cecum of the starch-fed mice, so this one section of the mice, mouse and uh, gut, they see that genes involved in acid stress are really upregulated in the starch-fed mice in this particular uh, region of the intestine. And in when they test the pH, it's low in the starch-fed mice. So again, it's just reinforcing like, hey, the bacteria are turning on genes like for acid adaptation, and yes, the pH is low. Uh, as another experiment, I mean, it's just basically a series of experiments testing this model. They look at intestinal inflammation. They add dextran sulfate sodium, which basically causes an inflammatory response, um, colitis. And then they look at record seek. So again, they're in gavaging with these wild type now, MD1655, the mice that have this essentially chemically induced colitis. And they see that genes for membrane integrity and heat shock, genes that we know to be induced by oxidative stress, which would happen in an inflammatory response, are upregulated. Again, super awesome. That's just what you would predict. And that's what they see. I think in the last set of experiments, they're getting into more kind of co-culture. What can we do with this? Can we see in kind of what we predict a little bit and the system works? Now they do co-culture. Um, they first co-culture with Bacteroidetes theta iota micron, omicron, which um, is a major inhabitant of the gut. And so they have just these Bacteroidetes that are sort of not labeled in any particular way. And they have their... their um, E. coli, which have this recording system in them. And when they do the co-culture, they see different things than they saw in monoculture. So what they see is that, that the genes that E. coli is turning on when it's in the presence of B. theta, um, the Spectroidetes species, are different than when it's by itself. And it looks like, based on what we know about B. theta metabolism, that B. theta is sort of digesting what's there and then spitting out what it doesn't use. And then E. coli is using what B. theta doesn't use. So they say B. coli, B. theta looks to be liberating nutrients, probably plant material E. coli can't digest, uh, and turning it into carbon sources E. coli can use. Um, in the six experiment, I think this is a little less successful and maybe shows a little bit the limitations of this. They use a 12 organism co-culture. So again, these are notobiotic mice. So they are essentially trying to build a microbiome that they, they know, and we know all 12 organisms in there. Um, here it gets a little muddy, I think in part because the MG1655 sentinels, most of them go through, but they are able to see differences in the 12 organism co-culture in gene expression in the MG1655 that are retained that were different from the monoculture or the culture co-culture with B theta. Um, and then in the seventh experiment, and I think this really shows some of the potential of this, they barcode and they multiplex. So what this means is they can add little tags and they can infect with two sets of E. coli, a wild type and mutant that both have this recording system, but they can tell when the sequences come from one of the bacteria, the, the, whether they come from the wild type or the mutant, by sort of a little tiny tag of sequence that gets added to these spacers. So they can actually watch two cultures at once, two strains at once, as they move through the digestive tract, and they can see if there are uh, differences in how they interact 
uh, when they go together than when they go independently. Essentially sort of competition in real time. Um, and here they prioritized a mutant that was important for growth in starch. It's for using hexaurinate, so another of these sugar acids. Um, when they do this barcoding in the mutant that can't digest this hexaurinate uh, sugar acid, they see down regulation, not only obviously of the one that's defective because it isn't there, but also other genes in that pathway, which makes sense because if you can't use it, you can't use it. Um, they also think what's happening is that the wild type is probably displacing the mutant where these sugar acids are available. So maybe it's even allowing, uh, so wild type sort of outcompeting them for, you know, certain niches. Obviously, if it can't use these sugar acids, it's not a good place for the mutant to grow. Um, and then I think finally, and again, I'm not sure this that co-culture was necessary to see this, but they see that this hexuronate defective mutant, um, it seems to upregulate pathways to use other sugar, other carbon sources, including serine threonine, so amino acids, and also maltose, so a sugar. And again, I think what's really amazing here is you can imagine all sorts of experiments, and they just kind of showed you, showed a few. I think it's really beautiful, not only because it worked, which is amazing, but also that for many of their experiments, they can have a hypothesis based on the gene expression that they can then test. And I think it will be really amazing to see what people do with this, and if we can put it into other organisms... Um, perhaps ones that are you know, more dominant, like the bacteroidetes, to see what's happening inside the gut in these other organisms that are you know, really dominate the microbiome more than E. coli. And that would be especially important. Think about the paper we did two twins ago where we're introducing a probiotic yep. and yep. asking what that does to the gut in total. And so you have your sentinel microbe in there, you introduce a probiotic, and the sentinel microbe is, is already reacting to the community in general. You add one more player, only one, the probiotic, and then you say, what's happening with the sentinel? And you may get an uh, inkling of, of what's going on, and it may give you an understanding to be able to you know, it's a hypothesis generating tool that you can figure out what these microbio, uh, microbiome probiotics are actually doing. Because, you know, that clinical trial with the bifidobacterm was pretty, pretty impressive. I mean, we were able to add one microbe and we were able to see alleviation of cardiovascular symptoms. And anxiety. But we don't know why. <laughs> we don't know why. Don't forget the anxiety. The anxiety, yeah. We, we cannot forget anxiety. That's the best part. So, yes. so, Petra, the acquisition of the spacers happens in a linear fashion. That's how they can deduce temporal uh, yeah. information from this. Is that correct? Yes. And spatial. And spatial. Because it's going through... You know, you eat it, it goes in via the gavage yeah, and it yeah. comes out at the other end. No, but the, the stuff that goes in in the stomach, say, versus the, the colon, you can tell because of the linear arrays, right? They're they're added in a certain order. They're not just added randomly. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what came from the top versus the bottom, right? I believe so, yes. But what's also important is that um, they also can go in and essentially pull them out at different stages. Right, right, right. Although that so is they, disruptive. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. So, so I think a lot of it, they just collected the feces where you have the yeah. whole thing. But they could de obviously they can decode it. And I think they pulled out the cecum just to see if uh, what, what they were deducing was correct that, in part. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It is amazing. So you, and I mean, I think get, it would be really interesting. I mean, in theory, you can – it's a plasmid. So it probably depends on the organism. But I could imagine bacteroidetes being able to engineer it or even these probiotics like the bifidos or the uh, lactobacilli, mm -hmm. you know, what are the, what happens to these probiotic things when yeah. you put them in themselves? Not only what happens to other bacteria. I mean, and E. coli is in a way, even though it's easy to purify out of the gut, it's, I don't have the impression it's the most important bacteria in the gut normally. And so it'd be really interesting to be able to see what happens to these other organisms that we know are doing a lot of the work in digesting our food 
um, and are associated with yeah anxiety and depression and other things to these guys using the system. And and again, it might be trickier. E. coli is you know a great choice because it's super easy to engineer um, to see what happens with these other things. Cool, very cool. Well, if it is, if it's easy enough to do, people will use it, right? That's the way it works. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. I mean, I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing more uh, yeah. experiments like this. And and again, this is like a big thing when people, I think we've sort of in a way reached the limits of these big microbiome metagenomics, met, you know, RNA seq mm. experiments where there's just so much information, but it's really hard to know when it happened and it's hard to analyze and it's just a snapshot, but yeah. to be able to have. Because again, by the time if you started the seek, you know, by the time you come out in the feces, you've turned off all the genes that might have been on higher up. So the real advantage of this is that you can see what happened higher up in the gut, and not just what's on when you pull those bacteria out of the feces, right? Because right, once they're right. in the feces, they're turning on different genes than they turned on yeah, earlier. Yeah. All right, thank you, Petra. Uh, let me read two short emails before we wrap it up. First is from Ken. The most recent TWIM spoke approvingly of confocal microscopes, and not for the first time. The history of its invention is very interesting. Marvin Minsky, the father of artificial intelligence and one of my mentors, invented it in the mid-1950s, and it was ignored for more than 20 years. He provides a, a link to an article in Chemistry World called Minsky's Microscope but maybe it needed yet to be invented technology to be a practical device. And Rona writes, I enjoyed this episode with Petra. Welcome. I, I went back and listened to her episode about the demon triclosan. I would love to learn more about dental health and microbes and one, what makes one more prone to cavities. Incidentally, what is a natural mouthwash or rinse or food I can make or eat or buy that enhances my dental health like a peroxide or baking soda, or salt water, or garlic, or ginger. What toothpaste does Petra use? <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm not going to advertise. Um, I use, I think, a Tom's of Maine toothpaste. Um, I think you could just use baking soda. Actually, this is more Michael's domain. Um, <laughs> but um, I think, I mean, salt water should actually be decent. Baking soda is decent if you can stand it. Um, Michael? If you can stand it. If you that's, can stand that's it. Baking soda is not pleasant, but it is good. Hmm. It's, it's all about, uh, I mean, there are some Middle Eastern remedies uh, that are effectively using tree twigs that actually have essential oils in. And if you think about it, Listerine is really using essential oils. And many of the essential oils that were natural remedies that were from before we understood germ theory have been used. And many native cultures use uh, essential oils to mm. improve dental health. And so Listerine, which is principally essential oils, is one of those good mouthwashes. And Listerine is quite effective at, you know, balancing and not going one extreme over the other. Some of the others, like peroxide, is scorched earth. It it comes in like a nuclear weapon and just wipes everything out. And then you could have a founder effect like we see with antibiotic-associated colitis with some of the antibiotics and the emergence of the C. diff pandemic that we're having. Yeah, exactly. That's like intense oxidative stress. Yes. You know, Mike, I used to brush, then Listerine, then brush again. And I stopped because it was irritating uh, the gums. The, yeah. the hygienist said, what are you doing? It, your gums are all irritated. I told her, she said, no, just brush and that's it. No, no, nothing in between. So it's, I stopped and it doesn't do that anymore. As long as you have good gum health, you yeah. hopefully will not become senile. <laughs> By the way, Michael, there's a great video on YouTube. My wife showed me the other day. They're harvesting lavender and making oil. They're these fields, yes. beautiful fields of lavender and the and the, the the machinery is made just to straddle like three rows. It cuts it up, puts it in a bin, and they put it in uh, the the farmhouse and they steam it to get the oil out. Then they condense it to separate the oil and the and the water, and then they pack it up. It's just amazing. It's this big scale we, we, lavender we should, oil. We should <laughs> drop that into the show notes I'll for that previous episode previous episode yeah. that went up people would would like it and that takes you to one of the other emails i don't know if you're going to read or not since you have to go 
Yeah, I'm going to save that for next time. Okay. Uh, because it's kind of long. So, uh, end email. Yes, but we'll we'll do that next time. All right, that's it for TWIM 266. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Send your questions, comments. If you want to know what uh, what red wine I prefer, you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> TWIM at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a 501c3. That means your contributions are federal U.S. tax deductible. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And thank you for coming to the incubator last week. It was oh, it was nice loads of fun. Loads of fun. Great to meet all all the fans and uh, actually see the space and, yeah. you know, lay eyes on Daniel and um, Amy. And, of course, always good to see Bridge and Dixon. And, Petra, next time you're back in New York, you must stop by, okay? Okay, I will. I'll be back there uh, in, uh, next spring. You were here uh, for your daughter's um, graduation? or No, she was looking at schools, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So next time you come back, uh, please, instead of buying bagels, just come to the incubator because <laughs> we have a nice bagel store below us. It just oh, okay. opened. It's I'm really there. good. I'm there. Petra Levins at Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.